Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, how many people here have heard of like real world assets? Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, and how many people here have heard of Ondo? Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> Ondo uh, essentially is an asset manager. So we create and manage funds. And I guess the reason why we're here, obviously, is we tokenize them and put them on chain. Um, additionally, we also have a technology arm that contributes to building DeFi protocols. Uh, bonafide DeFi protocols that actually run, obviously, completely autonomously on chain. Um, about five months ago, we launched our first fund, which we call OUSG. It's Ando's US government bond fund, or effectively, it's a portfolio of short-term treasuries. Um, and we also launched a DeFi protocol called Flux. Uh, Flux and OUSG work well together. I think one of the most important things when you're tokenizing something is that you actually have to have the tokens do token things, um, which sounds incredibly basic, but there's, I'd say, a fair amount of projects out there that think that just getting the token onto the chain is like the final product, but really, um, as we've seen with some of the other uh, speakers already today and, and coming up, is you actually need to do stuff on chain, right? Um, and uh, let's see, where are we about? Uh, I think we're about 200 million now in total TVL uh, across these different things. Um, and just sort of zooming out for a very, very high, high picture, what's the point of all this, right? Why would you even bring financial, like traditional financial assets on chain? And I think the underlying situation is in the real world, in traditional finance, you have all these different rails, right? You have different rails for money, different rails for securities, different rails for derivatives. Then you have these different rails across different regions. Um, and really the long-term vision is that you really want all the world's financial assets on the same rail. Um, and I think it's our position that that rail likely will be dominated by a public blockchain. You likely will have some element of maybe private blockchain in there somewhere, but by far and away, the real, you know, the real disruption and real innovation is happening in public blockchain. And so we started by bringing treasuries on chain. The reason for this is that it's sort of the simplest asset from the traditional world. It is the, one of the metrics for a very low or risk-free rate in traditional finance. Second, we are bringing a, a new product on chain, which is a money market fund in token form. And I can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and the general gist for Flux actually is also something that's very traditional in finance, which is really a repo market for treasuries. And the underlying mechanism there in traditional finance does you know, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in volume a day. And the general gist there with that market is you have an asset, but you don't actually want to sell it. And so you basically offer to repurchase it later on. So if you're, you're lending it out, and then you buy it back. And it's basically a mechanism for facilitating short-term cash usage. So either you need short-term cash, or if you're on the other side, of, other side of the repo, you're obviously going the reverse direction. Um, and the, like, what's the point, right? Like, what do people even use treasuries for, right? In traditional finance, and there's sort of like four major use cases for money. Generally, there's I want to pay somebody some money right now, or I need to hold on to money for a short period of time, or I need to hold on to money for a longer period of time, or I'm using it as some sort of collateral for some other financial activity I'm doing, whether that's like margin trading or loans. And in traditional finance, you have all these things that hopefully we all know and love, or maybe don't love, depending on the, <laughs> depending on the, the counterparty um, of, you know, say bank deposits, obviously, for short-term cash, you don't really keep a lot of money in there, right? Usually, if you have excess money, you would invest it somewhere. Uh, so, for example, if you're McDonald's and you're running your, your corporate treasury, you have some short-term cash needs where you need to pay your employees at the end of the month, you need to buy some potatoes to make french fries. Um, but generally speaking, any cash beyond that, you actually go and you stick in something safe that earns some yield, um, but it's not actually a bank deposit. And that's usually something like, uh, like your local government bond fund, I'm American, so this is US Treasuries, or something like a money market fund or a certificate of deposit. Um, and the on-chain equivalent of these are the products that we're trying to bring to market. So almost all of these are what you would consider to be cash equivalents. So thus far in, in DeFi, in on-chain finance, you actually have a ton of use for stable coins. And so stable coins in a zero interest rate environment make a ton of sense for almost all of these different use cases, right? Like if you're not earning any yield on something, why convert it into something else and then have to convert it back, right? Um, right now, the forward-looking yield on OUSG, net of all fees, is about 5.1%. So by keeping your money in stable coins when you could be investing in something like US Treasuries, you're literally missing out on you know, a very meaningful return. And so 
the general idea for OUSG is very much this medium-term cache storage, whereas OMMF is a little bit different, and I'll get into the details in a second, but we think it's actually very useful and interesting in terms of settlement for transactions as well as payments. And the essence of this is because uh, OMMF itself is basically pegged to a dollar. So um, just going into these in, in a little bit of detail, the underlying real-world asset behind OUSG is a BlackRock ETF called SHV. It's essentially a portfolio of short-term treasuries. The use cases here, as I mentioned, are more medium-term cash management and use for collateral. The investor geography for both these assets is global. The investor qualification for both these assets are qualified purchasers. And the issuer is a separate entity from Ondo called Ondo 1LP, and I'll get into the legal structure in a second and how it's designed to ring fence the assets away from our financial operations and keep investor assets safe. Okay, and just jumping into some of these details right now, so that just the, the current yield on the underlying asset for OUSG is 5.38%. We charge 15 basis points on the management fee there. You can see with OUSG, the treasuries, that there's some actual underlying volatility. This is because short-term treasuries do have some interest rate risk, and in the event of interest rates spiking, the underlying price can actually go down. With OMF, the real differentiation here is that it actually is a dollar. And so with a money market fund in the real world, um, and we haven't disclosed what the money market fund is yet, uh, we're launching this product hopefully in the next week or two, um, but the actual minting and burning that we do with the underlying money market fund provider actually happens at a dollar. And that actually can settle T plus zero. So it, it, a long time ago, you basically could like have a checking account based on your money market fund, and you can actually write checks out of your money market fund. And also for us, we can actually deposit and withdraw money from the underlying money market fund T plus zero. So we can effectively mint and create the, the, the tokens on demand. Um, now, you might be wondering, okay, if it's worth a dollar, where does the yield go, right? So with OUSG, the underlying yield all accrues to the value of the token. So the value of the token increases in value over time, whereas with the money market fund, all of the yield is paid out every single day in the form of airdrops of new tokens. So the money market fund is designed to be basically pegged at a dollar. It's a dollar, you can transact with it, you send money back and forth, it's worth a dollar. Whereas with OUSG, it's designed to entirely appreciate over time, and the main benefit for that really is that these different modalities are actually useful for different use cases in DeFi. So for example, with OUSG, if you're lending into a, a protocol like Flux or any other protocol, the actual uh, collateral as it's being pledged is increasing in value. So when you get that collateral back later on, that collateral is worth even more money, right? Whereas with a money market fund token and you're, you're airdropping interest to it and you send that token into a DeFi protocol, it's not entirely clear what should be happening there, right? Like you have to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, so that's the gist of the two different tokens. And then this is more just mechanically about how you invest and of course how you get your money back. Um, we have a complete KYC AML onboarding process. We have subscription documents. And within the actual smart contracts themselves, we have a whitelist that allows you to receive and transfer the tokens. These are full ERC-20 tokens. Anybody that's on the allow list, you can actually send the tokens back and forth. So these are very much full ERC-20 tokens in that capacity. There are some qualified uh, investor qualifications required. Uh, you can be uh, both an accredited, sorry, you're required to be both an accredited investor and a qualified purchaser. Um, and then once all that onboarding process happens, that happens only once. Uh, and then the, the, the actual mechanics are you can actually send us money either via a USD bank wire or via stable coins. And if we receive the money by a certain cutoff within the day, we process the subscription the same day. Otherwise, we handle it the next day. And then the following day, we send you the corresponding amount of the actual treasury token, and you receive that in your wallet. And then redemption is just the opposite direction. You send the treasury tokens back to us. We obviously destroy it. We see that it happens. We see it's coming from your address. We sell the underlying asset in the real world. We process redemption, and then we send you the money, depending on how you're asking for it, usually via stable coins, but we also can process redemptions via bank wire as well. And then I guess, lastly, the thing I wanted to mention before was that I mentioned this Ondo One LP entity. This is the sort of wider, darker gray rectangle in here. The legal structure we have is 
designed to partition the assets from the funds away from the, part, from the assets of Ondo itself. So Ondo Finance Inc. is our parent company. That's our operating company. That is not where the investor assets are stored. The investor assets are stored in this LP entity called Ondo One LP. The main idea here really is this is almost identical to how a lot of just traditional finance works. If you do private equity, you do venture capital, you do hedge funds, you have a structure that looks very much like this. And you can see the investor flow here is the loop around the darker, uh, the, the darker boxes. You send the stable coins, it goes to our account at Coinbase. Coinbase converts the stable coins exactly one for one into dollars. We wire those dollars to the actual real world asset provider. That's either our prime broker where we buy the ETF or the money market fund provider. And then once we see that those assets are actually bought, then we mint the tokens and send them back. But the general point of this elaborate structure is really just to protect investors. So the assets themselves are ring-fenced away from us. Um, it, it, this is really actually quite different than how stablecoins are, are, are created. You know, a lot, some of them say that they're actually bankruptcy remote, but may or may not be. Um, and I, I guess lastly also, this structure is actually very well understood. You know, so there's nothing novel really that we've done with this legal in infrastructure. This is just how a lot of traditional finance is actually done. And then lastly, I'll say that we have various different service providers. So for the stablecoin on-ramp and off-ramp, we have Coinbase. Uh, we have to have you know, a unanimous cons consensus of multiple different employees in order to perform any kind of critical action. Uh, these accounts obviously have limited permissions. These accounts are only allowed to transfer to the underlying actual um, uh, real-world asset uh, service provider. So in the case of OUSG, that's our prime broker at Clear Street. Um, the assets at Clear Street, again, are segregated into sub-accounts based on the different funds. They're separate from our accounts. And the, the key thing here, too, is like these are all backed one for one. So there's, these are cash accounts. They're not even margin accounts. There's no rehypothecation of the underlying assets whatsoever. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, a full visible audit trail as well as a separate fund administrator. So the actual NAV for the fund, NAV stands for net asset value. It's basically the value per share. So it's like the total assets in the fund divided by the number of shares that are out there. We actually don't calculate that ourselves. So our fund administrator, who's NAV Consulting, they are you know, a, a large ad administrator for tons and tons of, of hedge funds globally. Um, they effectively have read-only read access to all the different accounts that we have, and they can see how much money is in there. And then they're the ones who calculate the value of the fund, and, and we, we take that value and we publish that, on publish that on chain because they don't do that for us yet. Um, hopefully, eventually, they will do that themselves. Um, but um, they also produce uh, daily and monthly reports for all the different investors, and you're getting that from somebody else, not from us. And again, this is just how a normal asset manager works, but you know, we're doing that for, for these tokens. And then lastly, we have uh, a fund auditor that's under contract. We have to have this finalized by uh, the end of the year, but we think this will be done actually relatively soon. Um, yeah, lastly, a whole bunch of disclaimers. Um, you guys can read this at your, at your leisure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this is us. Uh, probably the best way to follow us is at Ondo Finance on Twitter. Um, you also can just find us at ondo.finance online. Um, and our, our inbox is always open at investors at ondo.finance. And uh, that's it, but happy to take some Q&A. A quick question. Um, I heard the minimum amount someone can invest in, uh, in Ondo is $100,000. Uh, mm -hmm. um, is that true? Yes. Why is that? And how do you see kind of like the, the future of like people in DeFi, obviously, you know, linking uh, KYC to wallets using Ondo? Yeah, great questions. Um, yeah, the, the answer is uh, yes, the minimum is $100,000. Uh, we started with OUSG in sort of the most conservative way possible for a lot of sort of different risk metrics. And so one of the ways that we started is that OUSG is really only designed for professional investors in the beginning. So we have a new product coming out that I can't quite discuss yet um, that is separate from OMMF that is retail focused. 
So it will have a minimum investment of like a couple hundred dollars. I think we're still deciding. I think it's going to be around $500. Um, but OUSG and OMMF were very much designed to be sort of like backbone financial instruments for, invest, for institutional investors moving money back and forth. And we have a somewhat similar to OUSG token coming out that is much more designed for that retail market. So the, the minimum investment there is going to be about $500, I think. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. I'd like to ask: uh, Do you think the structure that Ondo set up would work for other real-world assets, like you know, securities, other securities, art, um, things like that? Yeah. Um, so the the mechanism, in particular, for OUSG is just completely arbitrary for any ETF. So. Any ETF underneath the hood, you easily can just swap out some other ETF. You could imagine, say, an S&P 500 ETF or almost whatever you'd like. Um, in terms of things more like art and stuff like that, I'd have to think about that. You know, I think that's a little bit outside of our, our roadmap for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the vehicle by which we're doing this tokenization uh, is meant to be very, very straightforward. And so the time it took us to build OUSG and the time it took us to build OMMF are really quite different. And and honestly, the, the token part of all of this is actually almost the easiest part. It's really not that complicated to go and write an ERC-20 token and do those things. Almost the more complicated part is all the actual operations underneath the hood of like the real world assets and making sure that you're doing all those things, um, you know, managing the operational risk there you know, very well. So the, you know, the, the tokenization mechanism, I think, is, is completely reusable for, for you know, lots and lots and lots of different types of assets. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Remy. How are you handling timing of interest distributions for the money market fund? Is it standard time, transparent time, daily? Daily. Randomized? Yeah, it's daily. Sa standard time, transparent? Yeah, standard time, daily. Yeah, transparent. So how do you think about price fluctuations around that distribution time as use of you know, a payment mechanism in the future? Yeah, so it's a great question. So right now, the interest rate's somewhere around 5%, so you can think of that as somewhere around, you know, call it a basis point, a basis point and a half per day. Uh, you know, we, we can obviously see all the mint and redeems that happen during the day, and so if anybody is sort of like abusing that, we can just sort of talk to them and be like, hey, you're not supposed to be arbing us for like half a basis point, you know, that's, like, so, um, you know, so right now we don't have any subscription or redemption fees or anything like that, but we, we certainly could if somebody was doing something that was like high velocity transactions where they're just sort of like obviously are being a basis point. Um, but yeah, we, we designed that daily payout to be such that the, the value of the token doesn't fluctuate more than like, you know, a very little amount versus a, a dollar. Uh, and so we stand there ready to mint and redeem always at a dollar, and we actually think there'll be a pretty active secondary market for which people can, you know, send money market fund tokens back and forth and get, get a, you know, get, uh, say, an actual stable coin like a USDC uh, for it instead. Um, but I would expect that to mostly transact at very, very, very close to a dollar. Great. Thanks a lot, Justin. Mm -hmm. Thank you all.